Hey, hold on. Hello, how are you? Good, how are you? Oh, last day of impact. Very happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> you have some plans for the weekend? You can relax. Um, this weekend, have you ever seen the show Bridgerton? Uh, I've heard about it. I've never seen it. I know it's Netflix, right? Yes. Um, so they're doing like a Bridgerton Elizabeth Regency era ball in D.C., um, and my best friend surprised me with tickets. So I'm going to get to go to a ball tonight. <laughs> oh, nice. That's yeah. great. That's fantastic. I'm probably going to a Nats game tomorrow. Good. Yeah. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Good. Do you have anything fun planned for this weekend? No, actually, I think I might have mentioned to you, I am um, guest lecturing next week at... Mm -hmm. Higher Northern University, so I'll be getting ready for that. So, uh, oh, that's exciting! And it's in their business department, right? Not their legal department. Uh, yeah, business department. Okay. But they've set me up with a um, sort of intrigued. They've set me up with a private meeting with the dean of the College of Law. So that'll be nice. I've never that's met him. Exciting. Yeah. You think there's going to be a teaching opportunity there? Uh, that would be nice, but I, I, I doubt it. It's just, I don't know what to expect. You never I'll, know. Yeah. And I'll say my grandkids are coming over today. I, hopefully they don't get here before 11 o'clock. So <laughs> counting on my wife not bringing them before them then. Hey, Chris, how are you? So good. Um, how's everybody doing this morning? Good. Good. Excited to get this presentation over with. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, Courtney, uh, do you think that, I mean, are people going to be able to, how, how is the logistics going to work for people being able to participate or make a comment? So, this is set up as a webinar. So, essentially what happens is a minute before the scheduled start time, uh, everybody's admitted into a lobby. Um, and then when we hit the button, they get pulled out of the lobby into this meeting that we're in currently. Um, it's set up as a webinar. Uh, so that means everybody should come in muted. Uh, and if you want them to be able to speak to you, uh, we can have them raise their hand and then I can unmute them. Um, or if you just wanna have everybody put, put questions in the chat, they can post the questions in the chat and I'll transcribe them uh, from the chat into our chat. That way you can see them and then answer them uh, as you feel like, uh, yeah, in the schedule. Um, it's just kind of up to you. Okay. Well, Courtney, I'm assuming you'll, you'll address those uh, logistics with the group. Mm -hmm. Okay. So as questions come in, um, I mean, you'll be able to see them. Chris will be able to see them in the chat, right? Yeah. So Gene, if there are any that you, that stand out to you that you want to go ahead and respond to, you're more than welcome to. Um, you know, if you feel like one's kind of a softball question. Yeah. Actually, are there any softball questions you want me to have Dan put in the chat? No. Okay. <laughs> you know, what I was really kind of hoping for is not so much questions, but, or, or let me say, if there is a question that I could not answer, or Courtney, you, or Nadine couldn't answer, could somebody in the group answer? And I, is that possible? Oh, Chris is shaking his head, yes. Yeah, sorry, I just took a bite of something. Um, yeah, yes, it is. Um, you know, they are in the chat and other people have uh, you know, step, stepped up beforehand. If they know the answer, they'll, they'll drop it in. Okay. So drop it in in writing or can they unmute in, and talk? Unmuting and talk would go against you guys talking. Um, but having said that, if, you know, it, it really is kind of uh, open. If, if we want them to be able to speak, we have to manually unmute them uh, so they can be heard. So typically we don't, we don't do that just because it can get a little bit um, preform. Uh, but having said that, if that's what you'd like, there's no problem with us doing that. So what I think I'm gonna do is, um, Gene, if we get a question and if all three of us feel like we're not comfortable answering, 
Um, I'll also say like if somebody in the audience would also like to comment on that or you know respond to it, please go ahead and use the raise your hand feature. Um, and we can include you in the conversation. Okay. Yeah. That way it's a little bit more open. Yep. And then uh, what I'll do is I'll pay attention to it and unmute, unmute somebody as they raise their hand. Great. Sounds great. I'm going to test just sharing my slide really quick. Does that look okay to you guys? Yep. Yes. Perfect. Hey, Nadine. Hello. Good morning. Good morning, Jean. Good morning, Chris. Good morning. Nadine, every time I see you, you look different. I mean, I know. I changed my is, hair color this what morning. It's different now. I mean, sometimes I don't know. I just can't. Yeah. I like to keep people guessing. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Who is the real Nadine? Yeah, it's summertime. I was feeling like blonde was in order. <sighs> the rest of my team has seen me as a blonde before, so. <laughs> How are you this morning, Jean? <clears throat> I'm well, thank you. Yep, very well. Excellent. And Nadine, are you good on the run of show? You have the most recent copy. Um, why don't you pop it to the top of my inbox just in case? I don't assume that okay. it's changed that much. Courtney, I was thinking at the end when we get to the key takeaways, if you wanted to help me just go through, like we have two slides, maybe you take one and I take one. So it's not me doing all the talking from like, you know, slide eight to slide 16. I don't know. I can take the first key takeaway slide because that matches the ones that I do at the beginning of the presentation. Okay. All right. I can take those. Thanks. So that'll be 14 and then I'll take 15. No, okay. actually you'll take. Just, I thought I was doing 15. Yes, you are doing 15. Called recommended next steps. Perfect. Mm -hmm. I'll do 14 and then Courtney will do 13. I was looking for the ESG risk alert to just have pulled up in case people ask me any questions about that this morning. Nadine, I hear your dogs in the background. I know, unfortunately. <laughs> they're, um, I think they're barking at my husband. Jean, just to appreciate the chaos and craziness of my life. As I was telling Courtney, Chris already knows this about me. I like go big or go home. So we decided in one month to sell our house, buy a condo, and then we're starting construction on a house in Wyoming this summer. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I'm in the process of like closing all those loops, dotting I's and crossing T's this week. I've been there. I'm hoping my dog doesn't start barking though. They just want to be a part of the conversation. It's okay. <laughs> My husband uh, was saying that he um, he manages a pretty big group of lawyers. He's a he's an attorney, but he said that um, having insight, he feels like into people's just lives, like with little things like that, is really. Um, he feels closer to his employees given that he's had to be so connected. It's pieces of them you would normally not get to take part of or see in the office. He feels a little more connected. And everybody's used to Zoom now and realizing that, hey, life happens. You know, it's, <laughs> you know, it's not always uh, awkward or not awkward. It's not always convenient and, you know, convenient. <laughs> I sometimes it's awkward. Uh, Jean, you also need to right click on your image and change your name. That way we know, uh, people know who you are. So I might just uh, rename. Yep, hit rename and I'll do the same thing because I didn't realize I hadn't yet. <laughs> Is that okay? Yep, perfect. You know, I was remembering um, Nadine's comment and the comment about Zoom. I mean, when I was down in Florida, I was meeting with Dan, one of the first meetings with Dan. And, and so it was one of those deals where I was wearing shorts, but my top looked kind of professional, but I was <laughs> wearing shorts. And wouldn't you know it, um, 
my internet uh, Wi-Fi wasn't working properly and I had to move and I thought, oh shoot. So I had to pick up my laptop and there I am in my shorts. And so I thought, well, I learned a valuable lesson. <laughs> yep. Uh, it's definitely business on top and party on the bottom. <laughs> right. <laughs> so don't make to stand up today. I'm not wearing shorts, but I am wearing jeans. So. Courtney and Nadine, are you in the offices? I'm at home this morning. Yes, okay. I am also at home. Oh my goodness, okay. I think the only people in the office are Dan and then Alyssa today. We also got new laptops, so we're in the middle of migrating everything over. So we're trying to mitigate any uh, tech problems during this time or during the conference. Chris, do you by chance know how many people put this session on their agenda? Um, no, but I can see if I can find out real fast. Just curious how nervous I need to be. I wasn't nervous until I got talking to Courtney yesterday. Well, luckily it tells me that zero people have attended so far. Um, let's see if I go into the details. While he's looking at that, who controls the slide movement? Courtney. Courtney will. Okay. So if you just wanna say, you know, next slide, or if there's like a natural pause, I can go ahead and move forward, yeah. <laughs> And it looks like 164 people. Oh, great. We have um, the competing session with this is with Blair Marks, I think. And that one is at 111. All right. That one is my baby. I am uh, I'm the the person that runs that particular working group. So I'm a, I'm, I've had my fingers crossed. This should be a really fabulous conversation. Hi, Dan. Are you crashing our presentation? I am like super admin. So whenever I join a session, I show up in the green room. <laughs> Would you like to take a few slides and help us? <laughs> I'm just going to come and say, what I'm really looking for is legal advice. Can you provide some? No, um, absolutely not. Gene said he is the lawyer of the day. And he'll I have cannot to even do legal that. To everybody. <laughs> There's no, a I think it's I have run away. on everything. I think your presentation looks great, so I'm excited to hear it. But I will be off camera. You won't know. I'm going to jump over to see the other session too for half halfway through. Dan, the other session will be recorded, right? Yes. Okay, good. That's my. I worked with Blair and those guys on the session, and now I don't get to watch it, so I'm glad that I'll get to see it afterwards.
some of the few people that are using a real background. I have. <laughs> so my daughter created this for me. I don't know what it is. When I questioned her, she said, Dad, it's art. <laughs> so I guess that's good enough. Is it supposed to be a dog? I think it's supposed to be a fox, but you can't drink out of it. It's got sharp, pointy ears. It's it sort of looks like it's supposed to be, a, but there's no nothing here. So I don't know. <laughs> it's just a big paperweight. I wonder if they don't make ashtrays anymore. Like we, you know, uh, growing up, that was an art project that we had was to make an ashtray. But you know, nowadays with people e-cigging. And that's oh, yeah. I mean, this dates me, but I, when I was in shop class, yeah, we had to make an ashtray. Yep. <laughs> I was in the country. We made birdhouses in shop class. <laughs> okay, guys, we got two minutes left. So any last uh, things you have to do beforehand? I would go ahead and do them now. I'm going to fade into the background. Uh, I'll be here if anything goes on wrong. Um, and like I said, I'll keep an eye on the chats and also uh, muting and unmuting as uh, we need. Good luck. Thanks. Thanks. Courtney, when you start sharing your slideshow, where will we appear? Will we be like a gallery view? There we go. Does that answer your question? <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> Good. And you're also spotlit, so you guys are the three people at the very beginning of all the uh, attendees. And I'd go ahead and start your introductions in about a minute, and then go from there. Yep, there's people joining. Uh, Courtney, you might also want to recommend people mute themselves as they, as they come on. Oh, yeah. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, if you could go ahead and mute yourself, and we're going to get started with the presentation in a moment. Hi, good morning, everyone. If you want to drop in the chat where you're uh, listening in from today. And if you could go ahead and mute yourselves, um, we'll have an opportunity to engage a conversation a little bit later, but for now, we'll keep ourselves muted. Good morning, Katie. Nice to see you here. Hi, Jazz. Good morning. All right, so it is 10 o'clock. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us here today. Um, we're excited to talk about the DOJ's continued emphasis on high quality programs. And my name is Courtney Boone and I am the HQP Program Manager. I'd like to have my colleagues introduce themselves. Gene. This is Gene Farmer. I'm a senior advisor with ECI and previously spent uh, 30 years with Marathon Petroleum Corporation. Uh, the last seven of which I was the manager of their business integrity and compliance program. Great, thanks, Jean. Nadine, if you want to introduce yourself. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us this morning. My name is Nadine Ferlazzo, and I'm the manager of strategic partnerships and initiatives here at ECI. We're excited for everyone to be here this morning. Thank you. And as a reminder, as we get started, uh, this presentation is not necessarily meant to offer legal advice. 
This is meant to promote, uh, prompt some discussions around the considerations issued by the Department of Justice and considerations that practitioners may encounter um, related to different programs and different um, experiences within the profession. All right. So today we're going to be looking at five key themes that were related to the 2021 guidance released last, um, I believe, October or November, um, issued by the Honorable Deputy Attorney General Lisa Monaco. And some trends were built upon the 2020 guidance, um, while some strengthened expectations and requirements for the profession. And we'll get more in depth on each of these. So the first trend here is uh, emphasis on prosecution of individuals. So to receive any consideration for cooperation, uh, companies must identify all individuals involved or who are responsible for misconduct, regardless of their position, their status, or their seniority within an organization. Uh, previous guidance thresholds in, uh, included companies cannot limit disclosure to those in individuals believed to only be substantially involved in misconduct. Now the threshold includes all affiliation with misconduct, not just those who are substantially involved. Uh, the DOJ is looking to emphasize this to hold parties accountable and to incentivize the change in behavior. And corporations must provide the department all relevant facts relating to the individuals who are responsible for the misconduct. Trend two looks at comprehensive examination of all conduct, conduct whether criminal, civil, or regulatory. So prosecutors are directed to consider all misconduct now, whether it be civil, criminal, foreign, or domestic. And this is because misconduct history can actually indicate a lack of internal controls, um, as well as a poor in internal culture that does not prevent or dissuade misconduct. And prosecutors are expected to take a holistic approach um, this should include company characteristics, historical misconduct, and the history of actions in the different affiliations of the corporation. So you can really see here that the Department of Justice is just concerned with recidivism. I mean, the first note there indicates that 10 to 20 percent of significant corporate resolutions involve companies that previously entered into a resolution with the Department of Justice. So there, you, you get a sense there's some frustration there with, with corporations that are continuing to come before them over and over again. And so there's a real um, emphasis on considering whether pretrial diversion uh, techniques like DPAs or NPAs, uh, deferred prosecution agreements or non-prosecution agreements for Repeat offenders are really something that's going to be pursued by the Department of Justice. Um, there's, again, a, a concern that these companies are looking at these DPAs and NPAs as a, a break uh, from um, more serious consequences of, of trials and the penalties that can be produced by trials. Um, I, again, uh, Deputy Attorney General uh, Lisa Monaco indicated that she was concerned that DPAs and NPAs sent the wrong message, that they were simply, for some companies, the cost of, of doing business. So the DOJ is in the process of examining uh, previous DPAs and NPAs. Um, they just are concerned about whether, uh, again, an NPA or a DPA and companies under those agreements are taking their obligations, quote, seriously enough end quote. It's sort of like um, when I was a practicing an attorney, um, I would be frustrated with my clients who would take their contract and that we spent a lot of time negotiating and then just put it in the drawer and not ever look at it again. And I get a sense that the Department of Justice is concerned again about well thought out, well documented um, non-prosecution agreements just simply being put away and the companies that are subject to those just going about as business as usual. So the Department of Justice has indicated there's going to be quote, serious consequences uh, for companies that violate the terms of their NPA or DPA. It's interesting in doing some research, I, I looked at earlier comments from uh, the principal associate Deputy Attorney General, John Carlin, who indicated that 
companies need to understand that the punishment going forward, the punishment for violating an MPA or a DPA may be worse than the original punishment. So again, a real emphasis that companies need to pay attention to what's in the non-prosecution agreement or the deferred prosecution agreement and making sure that they're following those items. Next slide. So again, as part and parcel of this, there's just no presumption against monitorships. Um, uh, specifically, what was rescinded was prior guidance that said that uh, the criminal division would favor the imposition of a monitor only where there is a demonstration, demonstrated need for and clear benefit to be derived from a monitorship. So again, it doesn't have to be a clear need for a monitorship anymore. Uh, that guidance has been rescinded. That pendulum has swung uh, more in favor of having a monitorship. And the DOJ has indicated there's two considerations for whether to appoint a monitor. The potential benefits that employing a monitor uh, would have and the cost of a monitor. So uh, again, in, in looking at some previous comments, uh, specifically by Jay Rosen, he indicated that um, you know, there's behavioral and psychological benefits to employees of, of having a monitor, knowing that there's a monitor uh, involved and, and uh, making sure that the company is complying uh, with uh, the restrictions in those agreements. And of course, there's the benefits of, of compliance, a monitor enforcing that compliance. But as everyone knows, the cost of an independent monitor is borne by the company. And so what are those costs? That's going to be considered. And the effects of a monitor going forward on a corporation's business, will it be totally restrictive or significantly restrictive of a company's business? So again, the point here is that there's not a presumption against there being a monitor, but there's going to be more freedom in a case-by-case -case basis to have a monitor. And, and that last point there, a good program versus an inadequate program, uh, the DOJ has indicated that if you have a bad compliance program, uh, then they will consider imposing a monitorship. And if you have a good program, uh, perhaps a monitor would not be necessary. There was a question on the other team. What's an example of this kind of monitorship? Um, you know, I don't have an example off the top of my head. I wonder if anybody else in the audience would have such an example. We would like to encourage this to be an interactive session. So if anybody has answers to questions or would like to pop anything into the chat, we'd like to make sure that um, we're listening and learning from everyone here and not just the presenters. Allie, I will get an answer for that question and get back to you after the conference. Thank you. Okay, I get to tackle the fun part of this. Trend five, we're going to talk a little, about, a little bit about ESG, ESG claims and disclosures and what the DOJ um, is considering risks in these certain areas. As we continue to see an increase in investor demand for investment products and financial services that incorporate ESG factors, investment advisors are continually offering ESG investment options. This includes registered investment companies, pooled investment vehicles, and private or collected funds. In making investment decisions, some advisors and funds consider ESG factors. Next slide, Courtney. Perfect. So some of the factors that are going to be considered when claiming to invest in ESG funding is portfolio management and portfolio management practices, performance advertising and marketing, and compliance programs. Specifically around your compliance program, review of the firm's written policies and procedures and their implementation, oversight and review of ESG practices and disclosures. Next slide. So the DOJ put out a risk alert last year in April and my notes here come from that risk alert. Some key risks identified by the DOJ regarding ESG disclosures 
were a consistent lack of policies and procedures related to ESG investing, policies and procedures that weren't reasonably designed or well thought through, weak or unclear documentation of ESG related risks and decisions, misleading or false claims regarding ESG approaches, Courtney, could you go to the next slide? One that I really wanted to put, point out were the last two here, compliance programs that do not adequately address relevant ESG issues. This is a large area of risk around ESG. Firms substantially engaged in ESG investing, lacking policies and procedures addressing their ESG investing analyses, decision-making processes or compliance review and oversight is going to be a big area of risk around ESG. Additionally, the compliance staff having limited knowledge of relevant ESG related investment analyses or oversight ESG related disclosures and marketing decisions. Fun stuff guys. All right, there were some best practices that the DOJ put out around ESG funding. One was around disclosures. Make sure that when you're having ESG disclosures, they're clear, precise, and tailored to a firm's specific approach to ESG investing, and it aligns with the firm's actual practices. Some other recommendations were simple and clear disclosures regarding the firm's approaches. Clear disclosures in all client-facing materials where clients were offered choices among standardized portfolios and ESG factors that could be considered alongside many other factors. Up to your next slide, Courtney. So as we all know, we listened to Deputy Monaco, the Honorable Deputy Monaco on the opening day. She talked about the Corporate Crime Advisory Group that is going to be a task force put together under the DOJ. And this task force is going to be pretty widely tasked with a variety of things. I thought it was really, really important. The mention of the task force would include representatives from every part of the DOJ involved in criminal enforcement. The advisory group will be involved in examining monitor selections, evaluating the significance of recidivism and considering consequences for breaching of deferred prosecution agreements. In addition to this, the group would consist of an associate deputy's attorney general with input and representation from multiple components of the criminal division, including but not limited to the fraud section, the computer crimes and intellectual property section, as well as the national security division in cases involving export controls, sanctions, terrorism financing, and CFIUS issues. Additionally, there will be scrutiny of and enforcement against potentially false, misleading, or incomplete ESG statements to customers, investors, and other stakeholders. And if you see at the bottom of the slide right there, I put a footnote. I found this in the ESG risk alert. Companies should strongly consider subjecting themselves to vigorous internal reviews, particularly where the corporation has been subject to virtually any sanction previously by any regulatory or enforcement agency. It's a really important piece of information. The next slide, Courtney. All right, Courtney's gonna talk about some key takeaways from our presentation. So it's important to recognize that cor corporations must now provide to the department all individuals and facts believed to be associated with misconduct uh, if they want to qualify for considerations of cooperation. DOJ believes that an emphasis on the prosecution of individuals can deter illegal activity, uh, hold individuals accountable, and incentivize change within organizations. Prosecutors must consider all history of misconduct, as well as company characteristics and previous misconduct by affiliates of the company. And DOJ is also free to require the imposition of independent monitors whenever it's appropriate and ensure the company is living up to its compliance and disclosure obligations under deferred prosecution agreements and non-prosecution agreements. Perfect. Some of the key takeaways around the ESG piece. When communicating ESG investing to clients, prospective clients, investors, and prospective investors, be sure that you're evaluating whether disclosures, marketing claims, and other public statements are related to ESG investing. 
ensure accuracy and consistency between advertising and internal farm practices. And if you were able to attend the session yesterday with Francis from PRCA, he talked very, very heavily about how these things are related between your public facing communication and within your programs specifically. Evaluate approaches to ESG investing and implement them consistently throughout the firm where relevant. Be sure to adequately address in the firm's policies and procedures that they are subject to appropriate oversight by compliance personnel. Make sure that you're documenting and maintaining records relating to important stages of the ESG investing process. There's a question up here, Courtney, did we catch that? Constance Mitchko. I can get confirmation on the big, uh, the date that the uh, the guidance set in and respond to that question for you. Constance. So Courtney will be sure to follow up with you, Constance, on that. Perfect. Next slide. So I think this is me. So again, that first point there is uh, companies need to actively review their compliance programs. You need to be constantly looking at your compliance programs, updating them, making sure they're up to date. Um, I, I, again, the, the DOJ is very concerned about this. They indicated that, hey, look, if, if, uh, if, if your compliance program isn't working, it's going to cost you down the line. And that cost could be a monitorship that cost could be maybe not being able to get under a non-prosecution agreement or deferred prosecution agreement. I mean, the Department of Justice and, and the criminal justice system has all sorts of ways to uh, punish companies other than DPAs and MPAs through forfeitures and fines, uh, restitution, other reporting obligations. Again, as was indicated, uh, for clients facing investigations, uh, the Department of Justice has indicated that they're going to review the whole criminal, civil, and regulatory record, not just the sliver of that record. In other words, for an FCPA violation, they're just not gonna look at prior FCPA violations. They're going to look at everything. Um, they're gonna look at your full criminal, civil, and regulatory record when deciding which resolution is appropriate for your company. For clients uh, cooperating with the government, government, as we've indicated, they in, in, in need to in, identify, excuse me, all individuals involved in misconduct and all non-privileged information. Again, as, a, as an attorney, um, that really, as a in, former in-house counsel, that would really give me pause. I mean, that. That's what the DOJ wants. That's a requirement of, of the DOJ, and that's uh, that's going to be a, a, a challenge to do. Uh, they don't want just the folks that in-house counsel has determined is substantially um, uh, responsible. Uh, they're going to want you to err on the side of identifying all individuals who may be responsible and producing all non-privileged information. Again, for clients negotiating resolutions, there's no default presumption against monitors. We've talked about that, the, uh, the pendulum has swung. Uh, there's going to be a uh, more willingness on the part of the Department of Justice to appoint a monitor. And in response to a previous question, if you go to the Department of Justice website, they do have a list of monitors, at least um, in their fraud section that, uh, where monitors have been appointed. And again, the Department of Justice has indicated through um, uh, Deputy Attorney General Monaco that this is the beginning and not the end of their actions to combat corporate crime. This is just the start. And finally, corporations need to subject themselves to vigorous internal reviews. Uh, again, looking at uh, the 2020 guidance there, uh, the DOJ said that prosecutors should consider whether the company has engaged in meaningful efforts to review its compliance program and ensure that it's not stale. So again, um, 
your compliance program, your ethics and compliance program needs to be continually reviewed and, and uh, updated to make sure that it is not stale. Because if it looks like it's just been sitting on the shelf gathering dust, that's not going to be appropriate. And again, the, the, the punishment, uh, if you will, is going to be potentially more severe. Before we come to an end of the session, I'd like to open it up. As everyone knows, here at ECI, one of our main goals and priorities is to be a resource for our members. So as we're talking through some of these latest DOJ updates, we would love to hear from you guys in around these issues, whether it's monitorships, the NPAs and DPAs, or the ESG pieces. If there is any... Um, resources or opportunities that you would like to see the ECI work towards um, in our future programming to adjust these issues to continue to be kind of a voice in helping our members and our member companies as they continue to navigate the changes to the DOJ and other forthcoming um, information along these different topics. If you wanna raise your hand, Chris can unmute you. You can join the conversation. We have a question from Allie. Ahead, Hi. Hi. Thanks for all the great information today. I really appreciate it. Um, and I've been listening to a variety of the sessions this week about ESG. And we're completing our ESG report right now at our company, as well as we do an annual review of the DOJ expectations and FSG expectations for our total um, compliance governance. And I'm curious, a lot of the... Um, information shared today is uh, like laws in general. Um, it's general information and I'm not yet clear on what are the changes for DOJ. So an easy example is, um, Jean, you had mentioned that a compliance program should be maintaining itself and you know digging into monitoring evaluation so we do that, but how do we know we're doing it effectively based on these changes? Are there more specifics or case studies um, that you've heard or seen that you could share more about? Or even the ESG, I attended a session earlier this week about how it aligns to a compliance framework. Um, but again, it's it's all the same elements we've been thinking about, right? Like training, policy, controls. So like, what are the major changes with DOJ coming? That's a really long question, so I apologize. It's okay, I it's a great it's, question. It's good to preface that these were all identified as priorities for the Department of Justice and the, the Deputy Attorney General. Um, and that's a big piece of the corporate compliance group that they're administering right now. Um, we aren't 100% sure what that work is going to look like yet or what the final product is going to look like. So I think there are more specifics that are going to be coming out as that group evolves. So just kind of preface that as we're looking at some of these recommendations. I think this starts as an area of focus and it's going to get a little bit more substantiated with you know more information about expectations as that group evolves more. And what is the timing around that group? Like when do you foresee this? additional information um i can Wish. look up. <laughs> go ahead oh, sorry um if you want i can look up the expected timeline and let you know what the uh ex expected date is for publishing any deliverables from that yeah just general guidelines that'd be awesome yeah, and these are the kinds of questions that we're hoping to have here. These are really helpful as ECI continues to, as I said, be a voice in our space and, and bring you guys the answers to the questions and the um, services and resources and solutions that you need. These are really, really helpful for us to know where your companies are, what you're thinking, and how we can be a guide to you as we continue to navigate this together. ECI will be doing some research around ESG. We'll be doing continual programming. And we'll also be updating our um, HQP, which is our high quality program assessment to continue to align that with the DOJ's changes and priorities. So that's an important piece to keep an eye out for as well. And I did just get confirmation that um, it's kind of an 
indetermined or undetermined timeline at the moment, but to not expect anything concrete before the fall. Um, so it's probably going to be about a year before anything is formally published. Great, thank you. They usually tend to roll out their updates around October-ish, like kind of close to the end of the year. Thanks, Sally. That was a great question. Does anyone else have any questions or would like to add anything to the conversation? We would love to hear from you all. We still have a significant amount of time here to talk and to um, go ahead, Courtney. We have, we have another okay. question from Gloria. Go ahead. Good morning. Um, so just one general question and then one more specific question. So um, will the slides be made available? Yes, we can share these. Okay. And then um, I, I had, I, I wanted to know a little bit more about NPAs and DPAs just because I'm not personally as familiar. I think your slide had the percent of, I'm just curious as to how frequently those are put in place. Yeah, I'm not sure how, I mean, I do not know how frequently they are put in place. I think, again, either Courtney or Nadine could provide some information um, on uh, monitorships that it, it exist right now. Again, that 10 to 20% figure came from remarks by Deputy Attorney General uh, Monaco. So she had indicated that uh, 10 to 20% of of those corporate resolutions involved companies that had previously had a resolution with the DOJ. Okay. So that's as good a percentage as I had. Got it, okay, thank you. And Gina, that actually reminds me of something. Um, so ECI actually has the opportunity to meet with DOJ and the Deputy Attorney General uh, coming up later this year. And we're gonna be discussing some of the corporate crime advisory topics as well as meeting with some of the group members. Are there any topics or issues that you feel like would be good to raise with them? We'd love to get your feedback just as an attendee or participant of um, our impact conference. Feel free to drop those into the chat or raise your hand. We'd love to hear them. A question from Luis. Uh, good morning from Columbia. Great conversation and content. Could you please talk about the process and schedule established by the DOJ for those to solve the identified issues? Thanks. So Luis, thanks for your question. That's going to be um, based on that timeline we talked about with the Corporate Crime Advisory Group. So likely nothing before the early fall, um, probably before the end of this year, or early next year is when you can expect um, more regarding those issues that we discussed. I see we have another question from Allie. Sorry, I'm super curious. <laughs> um, going back to one of your early slides, um, there was a segment about inadequate controls. And I'd really love to learn more about that as you enter into those conversations. You would state and maintain, monitor, and update clients' ESG related investigating investing guidelines mandates and restrictions. So that's an area that I would like to learn more about. Okay, great, thank you. We will definitely include that in our list of things to share. And Nadine just, just shared a uh, great resource in the chat, um, talks more about MPAs and DPA outcomes, if you'd like to take a look at that. It's pretty detailed. It's everything through the end of 2021. You're welcome, Gloria. And as far as ECI content, is there anything related to this topic that you'd like to see more programming um, or, or more events or presentations about related to this topic? If there's a specific area you really want us to hone in on, please let us know because we can use that to shape um, a lot of our events coming up for the rest of the year. Yes, 